Well, welcome to Unchurched with Pastor Todd. I am he, and a breeze just came into the building. I'm going to consider it the wind of the spirit. You're going to see a fun thing today. You're going to see a preacher preach the light from the darkness. I'm having just a uh, really horrible day today. I was shaking as I went to leave my house to come and preach. And uh, so I'm going to do what I can with God's help to uh, bring you the word in a way that hopefully encourages you. As always, I'm keeping two different types of people in mind here, uh, churched and unchurched. I'm thinking of you if you kind of are away from your church right now. Maybe it's summertime and you're at the dock or perhaps you've lost your church uh, through the course of this crazy 16-month COVID-19 thing. Uh, Many churches have closed. Uh, Many people are now displaced from their church. And so if that's you, I'm holding you in my heart today. And I hope that as we explore the story of Jesus, um, you see him and uh, you're reminded of your friendship with him. I'm also keeping you in mind, if you're totally not a church person at all, you're spiritually curious, you're wondering about God and the story about him and what it might mean to have a relationship with him. And I'm gonna do my best here to uh, give you some touch points that will hopefully help you, you know, take a step uh, in the direction of a relationship with God. There may be some things that uh, we're not totally on the same page about, and that's totally cool. Um, I work really hard to make sure that at least some of the things I say Um, are applicable to you, even if uh, you've never set foot inside one of these buildings. I just want to remind you of our uh, hands and feet jar. This is where, at the end of each month, we put um, a percentage of the proceeds that comes in via Patreon uh, to good use. This month, our partner is React Kenya. You can find out about them on their website, reactkenya.com. And so uh, when you join us as a financial partner, we uh, dedicate a certain percentage of that to doing good in the world. And we'll just keep finding inspiring partners who are doing good hands and feet work all around the world. So visit them, reactkenya.com. And if you'd like to make this channel go, patreon.com slash unchurched. Also, please make sure that you like, subscribe, and do share this message. If uh, you find it encouraging in the least, uh, share it with somebody who you know could use a good word. Now, let's open our Bibles and get to work. Act Like You Are is the hook for this series. We're working our way through the book of Philippians, Act Like You Are. Today, I want to invite you to consider what it might look like for you to act like you are Jesus. (laughs) might seem weird, but that is the definition of the word Christian. Christian literally means, in its original sense, little Christs. So when you are looking to be a Christian, you are looking to be a little Christ. You are looking to become more and more like Jesus. Act like you are like Jesus. Jesus. Now, for the sake of those of you who don't know much about Jesus, of course, you've heard his name. (laughs) Oftentimes, many people hear his name for the first time in the context of a curse word. Someone says, Jesus Christ, right? They say his name in vain. Of course, uh, that's often our first introduction to him, um, and you don't really know much more than that. You know, there's a whole bunch of people in the world who supposedly live their life uh, in relationship with him, but that's about the limits of your uh, knowledge when it comes to Jesus. If I were to describe Jesus to you in terms of what he did. Um, The story about Jesus tells the story of the ultimate act of loving self-sacrifice. And I didn't know when I came to this series that um, self-sacrifice, giving your life away for the benefit of others, would end up being kind of the big idea of this series, but it just keeps coming up week after week. So I believe that the Holy Spirit uh, might be saying something to our hearts. So if we describe Jesus in terms of what he did, the story about him is that he committed the ultimate act of loving self-sacrifice. So if you want to be like Jesus, you're gonna need to learn, I'm gonna need to learn how to do the same thing, how to learn to lovingly sacrifice my wants, my needs, my desires for the benefit of others. And uh, to do that, you're going to uh, have to live um, like this. Here's (laughs) Philippians chapter one, verses 19 through 26. Paul here is speaking, he wrote the book. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. But with all boldness, as always, so now also, Christ, hallelujah, will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. Famous verse here. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit, from my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. For I'm hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. 
And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. The hook here is that famous verse, for me to live as Christ, to die as gain. That's a verse they teach you in Sunday school if you grow up in church. Um, that's the kind of verse you'll see on some guy at the beach. He'll have it on his t-shirt. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. This is a, a glimpse into Paul's life goal. His goal is to be like Jesus. For me to live is Christ. He wants to be like Jesus. He wants to be like the one who gave his life as the ultimate act of loving self. Sacrifice. For Paul, that's the highest goal. I want to be like Christ. Remember the... Uh, was it a song or a commercial? I want to be, I want to be like Mike. Right? I wanted to be like Michael Jordan to grow up and be able to play basketball like him someday. Well, Paul felt that way about Jesus. I want to be like Christ. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Jesus is Paul's ultimate goal. So if you want to be like Jesus, so that's speaking to you if you come from a church background and you have that concept in your mind, if you want to be like Jesus, we're going to walk through some points to help you be that way. And if you come from a more unchurched background, and this is kind of your first dipping of the toe into exploring who Jesus was and what the implication of his life is, then if you want to live a life of self-sacrifice, if you're feeling like you need to live your life, not just for the betterment of yourself, but for the betterment of others, these are some of the things you're going to have to consider doing. One, you're gonna to need to learn to live certain of supernatural deliverance. We get this out of verse 19. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. Here it is, through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Paul believes that the prayers of the Philippian church to whom he was writing are going to deliver him. Paul believes that the working of the Holy Spirit of God is going to deliver him prayer, and the Holy Spirit. I just want to point out, it's clear as mud, but sometimes we don't notice. Paul believes in the supernatural. He believes that it's real, and not only does he believe, but he's depending on it. Ah, there's the rub. He's depending on the supernatural for his deliverance. This um, is good Jesus-like behavior. Jesus, in the time he spent on earth, depended on his father, God the Father, God the Son, Jesus Christ in his incarnation, God the Holy Spirit. Christianity sees the Godhead as a triune God, three. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Okay? One God in three persons. So Jesus, in the time he spent on earth, depended on God the Father for everything. He only did what he saw his Father doing. That's a paraphrase of a famous, very famous verse in John chapter 5, verse 19. He only did what he saw his father doing. He depended on the father for everything. Paul is depending on the prayers of the Philippian church to deliver him. He's depending on the working of the supernatural Holy Spirit of God to deliver him. So I wanted to ask you this question. To what degree do you have a supernatural dependency? It's like touche preacher, right? I think the answer is, of course, well, I don't depend on the Holy Spirit very much at all. Most of the time, I'm trying to fix things myself. Most of the time, I'm trying to do things uh, myself. Look, I'm a preacher. I've been a preacher since I was 19. I'm now 47. That's an awfully long time in the pulpit. And even I, throughout my week, constantly catch myself trying to save myself, trying to fix things myself. To what degree do you have a supernatural dependency? So maybe ask yourself this question, if that just hit a little bit close to home. What might it look like for you to start living like miracles still happen. Do you believe in miracles? I don't like being divisive, but I do believe that there is a dividing line that runs amongst humanity. I think there are people who believe in miracles, they believe in the supernatural, they believe that there's more to life than just what you can taste, touch, see, smell, and hear. They believe there's that added magical supernatural element that's at work in the world. And then I think there's a group of people who don't feel that way. They feel like all there is is the material world. Okay, there's no special significance to who we are or what we do. We're just a grouping of atoms 
working our way merrily or miserably through space-time. So you need to wrestle with that a little bit and see what kind of person you are, where you fit on that. Let's call it a spectrum for the sake of unity. Because I, I, it's true, right? Nobody is all one thing all the time. But where you fit? Do you believe in miracles? Little kids do. It's as we grow up that we begin to uh, stop believing the fairy tales. What's it going to look like for you to live this week like miracles can happen? For me today, I was driving in my car literally praying out loud, God, deliver us. God, deliver us. Oh, God, deliver us. I, I felt a little foolish. In fact, I won't lie, I was praying out loud, parked at an intersection, and I actually covered my hand so that the person next to me wouldn't see me praying out loud and call me in for being unstable. I know for me, I need a miracle. And maybe the same is true for you. What's it going to look like for you to live like you still believe in miracles? Also, um, what's it going to look like for you to live, point two, full of expectation and hope? I love this. I need this. Verse 20, um, according to my earnest expectation and hope. Let me uh, tell you the definitions there of uh, earnest expectation and hope. So this is great, actually. This is um, less spiritual than you might think. So earnest expectation is premonition, according to my premonition, and hope is expectation. So literally here he's saying, according to my premonition and expectation. The reason I like this is because it reminds me of how I tend to live, and I assume it's kind of how you tend to live. I got a feeling. Do you ever make decisions based on a feeling? I know some people like to say that they always make their decisions based on facts, but I don't believe it. I don't believe that that's true, and that could be speaking from my bias. But I have made many decisions based on a gut feeling. How do you feel? I've got a feeling. So Paul's saying here, according to my feeling, my premonition, he's got a feeling and he has an expectation. So he's got these two things that I have, maybe you have. I got a feeling and I have an expectation that God's going to come through. That's the cool part. That's why we do unchurched here. Because you know all about having a feeling that something's about to happen. But maybe this is kind of the first time you're considering the fact that God can be depended on. Maybe if you've been one of God's friends for a lot of years, you're in a season where you've forgotten that. Well, let this be a reminder to you. Hallelujah. God can be trusted. Paul was expecting God to come through. He had a feeling and an expectation. That, that's a recipe for living right there. Okay, you have a feeling, you have a premonition. Pay attention to those things. Wow, expecting God to come through. And if you're going to live that way, you um, might as well, point number three now, um, live boldly for Jesus and shame be damned. <laughs> Hallelujah. If you're going to be all in, you might as well be all in. You might as well live boldly for Jesus. Again, from an unchurched perspective, you might as well live your selfless life as boldly as possible. And, and shame be damned. We get this out of uh, verse 20, and it's powerfully encouraging. According to my earnest expectation and hope, here it is, that in nothing I shall be ashamed. Woo! But with all boldness, as always, so now also, hallelujah, Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. I could preach to myself right here. I know that in nothing I shall be ashamed. But with all boldness, as always, I love this. Two things here I want to point out. Kiss shame goodbye. Somebody say, touche preacher. Is your life run by shame? Do you have a hard time sleeping at night because you're so ashamed of what you've done? Kiss that shame goodbye. Well, why? How? As you enter into relationship with Jesus, you will be able to kiss that shame goodbye. Why? Because he's the shame killer. Hallelujah, he's the shame killer. I'll tell you why in just a second. Kiss shame goodbye and then make a habit of boldness. I love that Paul says, and with all boldness, as always. <laughs> it's confession time. He's saying, I'm always, I have been accused of being bold. Touche, preacher. I have been accused of being intense. <laughs> Touche, preacher. And he's not backing down. He's not giving up. He's not letting somebody pin him in a corner. He says, I know I'm not going to be ashamed. Therefore, with all boldness, 
What is shame? Here's the uh, Merriam-Webster definition of shame. Listen carefully. It's a painful emotion caused by consciousness of guilt, shortcoming, or impurity. That's what shame is. Consciousness of guilt. What is boldness? Boldness is fearlessness in the face of danger. (laughs) Notice it's not fearlessness in the absence of danger. How many of us seem to live quite fearlessly when everything's hunky-dory, but the minute life takes a terrible turn, we find ourselves falling apart. I found myself right on the precipice of that. I can barely hang on to hope. These barely, I'm just barely. It's like skin of my teeth, like hanging on. I imagine I'll look back on this season in my life a few years from now and go, whoo, I don't know how we got through that one. That's what boldness is. Fearlessness in the face of danger. So, why don't we have to be ashamed anymore? Because at his cross, Jesus Christ, I told you about the ultimate act of self-sacrifice that he committed. In his crucifixion, he actually went to a Roman cross. He was pinned there by the Roman authorities. He was accused of a crime he didn't commit, accused of being a seditionist and a revolutionary. It was the religious elite who wanted him killed because he was threatening their system of religious governance. Romans just wanted to keep the peace, so like, whatever, just crucify him. But there's more to it than that. See, because he was going to the cross according to the will of God, his father. You'd be thinking, well, why would his father want to kill his son? That doesn't seem like a very good father. There's this concept in the biblical story that sin requires death. The wages, the cost of sin is death. And you might be inclined to think that that seems unreasonable until you think about every time somebody sins against you, how something has died in that relationship. Could I get an amen in this house? That's what happens when we sin against one another. Things die. The cost, the wages of sin is death. And so God who is holy, he's without sin. In his holiness, he had to do something about his sinful people. Remember the story of Adam and Eve, our first parents? How they sinned and rebelled against God in the Garden of Eden? Basically thumbed their nose at him. Screw you, God, we're going to do whatever we want to do. If you don't know the story, just go back to the book of Genesis. The first book in the Bible, the story's right there. Read chapters 1, 2, and 3. They rebel against God, and as a consequence of their rebellion, sin enters into the world, and death enters into the world. And every human being born since deals with this thing called a sin problem. Exhibit A is your three-year-old. You're like, oh yeah, you got me now, (laughs) right? Three-year-olds are evil, pure evil sometimes. And then maybe as you grow up as an adult, people have sinned against you. Maybe you were sexually abused. Maybe somebody destroyed your business for no reason. Maybe, I don't want to keep going. Think about those horrendous things that have happened to you as a result of sin. Sin is real. We just don't like to admit it because the minute we admit it, we feel convicted because we know that we are sinners. And the funny thing about sinners is I never met one who was happy about being a sinner. Yes, once in a while you meet somebody who's so jaded, so far gone in rebellion that they put up this front like they're cool and everything's fine and I'm great and... I don't know what you're talking about. But I have had people like that come back to me years later and confess, you know, I was fronting, I was totally pretending. My life is miserable. Please, can you tell me about this Jesus you keep preaching about? See, the problem with sin is that it's corrosive. It destroys. The wages of sin is death. We don't like to admit that sin is real because the minute we do, we admit that we are sinners. And C.S. Lewis was the great philosopher, writer who spoke most eloquently about this. We know deep in our bones that there's something about our sin that is not just wrong, but it's cosmically wrong, that it offends the framer of the cosmos. We have this innate sense that if there is a God, that God must be holy, that God must be perfect, that God must be ultimately good, right, moral, and true. And therefore, if that God is that way, and we know in our bones that we are sinful, we just know intuitively that there's a barrier between us and God. And it's that barrier that Jesus Christ came to deal with. He came to abolish it in his body, to borrow the terms, to borrow the term from the New Testament. He came to break down the dividing wall in his body. You see, because the wages of sin is death, God the Father chose to punish God the Son in your place for your sin. You're like, how could that possibly work? Because Jesus wasn't just a spiritual teacher. He wasn't just a man. He was the God-man. This is what the Christians believe. 
This is what I believe. That this is God the Son made flesh, God in a body, walking around on the face of the earth. And so when he goes to the cross, it's not just a good man dying, it's the God man dying. And because he's God in a body, he is more than big enough to bear the sins of the world. And so that's what happens at the cross. God the Father places the sins of the world, the iniquities of us all, on God the Son. He imputes our sinfulness to him and his righteousness to us. Again, boring the words of C.S. Lewis. In that cosmic hinge moment, your badness goes to Jesus and Jesus' goodness comes to you. Once and for all. And he dies the death that you should have died, the death that I should have died. He pays the penalty for your sin and mine. And it pleased the Father to crush him. Why? Because he knew that in so doing, he would be freeing all those who would enter into friendship with Jesus from the weight of guilt and shame that they bear forever. And that's a beautiful thing. I mean, somebody say hallelujah right there in your home. The best news about Jesus is that he didn't stay dead. The third day, Easter Sunday morning, he arose again, defeating in his body the power of Satan, sin, death, and hell. He, he did it. He's the master of the universe. He crushes the power of sin in that moment. He crushes the power of Satan in that moment. He crushes the weight of all the evil things that have ever been committed against you in that moment. So as you enter into friendship with Jesus, that's what's on offer for you. This is why all these many years later, people still enter into friendship with God. Because although on many levels it doesn't make much sense, on this level, it resonates deeply. You mean there's a way for me to get rid of this guilt that keeps me up at night? Yes, and his name is Jesus. Maybe it's time for you to come to him today. This is gospel preaching today. I don't care if the channel's on church, sometimes you gotta preach the gospel. You can come to him right now, you can say, Jesus, I believe what this preacher's saying even though I don't really understand everything. I wanna come to you today, I wanna enter into a relationship with you. Could you do that supernaturally? Could you do that? Holy Spirit, come into this room right now where I'm watching and, and change my life. Just lift that burden of shame and guilt that I've been bearing. Do you feel it happening right now? You should feel it happening right now. Thank you, Jesus, for dying in my place for my sins. Thank you, Jesus, for rising again for my salvation. Forgive me of my sins. Help me to begin walking in newness of life. Hallelujah. Hey, welcome to the family. Hallelujah. Send me an email if that's you, toddcandelon at gmail.com. You'll see it right there on screen. Send me an email, let me know. I'd love to follow up with you. You can live guilt-free when you are one of God's friends. Hallelujah. That's reason enough right there. You can kiss shame goodbye. And because Jesus is the master of the universe, because he is the one who has conquered death, you don't ever have to be afraid anymore. Because if, oh, hallelujah. If he's your friend, Everything, everything's going to be all right. Oh, are you receiving it? <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm glad I came tonight, Devin. Everything's going to be all right. Why? Because Jesus is the master of the universe, and he is my dearest friend. This is why I follow him. Because he's dealt with my guilt, and he has helped me overcome my fear. Hallelujah. If you want the same for you, point number four now, you need to live with Jesus as the center of your life no matter what. We get this out of uh, verses 20, part B, through verse 21. Here it is. But with all boldness, as always, I love this, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death, here it is, for to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. To live is Christ, to die is gain. His deepest desire is that Christ, that Jesus would be magnified in his body, that in the things he does, he would show off the glories and the beauties of the one who gave his life as the ultimate act of loving self-sacrifice. That's why he can say, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. This demonstrates the radical weirdness of Christianity right here. And here it is. This is Christianity's weird. I admit it. There's a paradox. If you want to get the most out of life, you need to quit living for yourself. Put that on a t-shirt. I mean, put, put that on screen. If you want to get the most out of your life, you need to quit living for yourself. You need to orient your life like Paul did around the one 
who committed the ultimate act of loving self-sacrifice. And you need to begin living like a little version of that. And then like we talked about last week, point number five, you need to live focused on fruitiness. I love this. I love it so much. Verse 22. But if I remain. So he's saying I'm hard pressed. I want to go and be with Jesus, but I know that I need to stay and help you. That's what Paul is saying to his Philippian readers. If I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Fruit. So when you talk about fruit in a biblical context, you typically mean two kinds of fruit. One is the fruits of salvation, the other is the fruit of the Spirit. I've touched on the fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are all good things, very good things. But in this context, we're not talking about the fruit of the Spirit. We're talking about the fruits of salvation. And what are the fruits of salvation? What are gospel fruits? What are good news fruit? If you're the kind of person who's living the good news, what's your life going to look like? We've touched on this in this series. It's going to look like you are partnering with God in the redemption and the renewal of all all things. It's that kind of fruit. It's redemption and renewal fruit. I wish I could find some. I'd bring like a weird guava and like some kind of strange fruit that I've never seen. It's redemption and renewal fruit. That's the kind of fruit you need to be cultivating in your life if you want to be like Jesus. You want to build a life worth living? Build it focused on spending your life working towards, oh, hallelujah, redemption and renewal in everything you do. Try that one on for size and see how it changes your whole approach to life. Even if you are not yet believing with me 100%, that's okay. You can still apply this truth to your life and change the world. Begin loving every, every moment. Begin engaging every interaction as if your job is to bring redemption into that moment. To redeem is to buy back. So think about slavery. It's like you're going in with money to buy a slave out of slavery and set them free. Live that way and you'll change the world. Renewal, we all know about this. This is like you're planting a fruit tree in your garden and cultivating it over years so that your garden can be renewed. A million people start doing this in their city and the city is renewed. If you begin living your life with redemption and renewal at the heart of it, not just your life will change, not just the lives of everybody around you will change, but the entire world will change. And I want to invite you, in fact, urge you, because I'm trying to be bold like Paul was, to live this way, point number six, even when you're conflicted. I mean, thank God that Paul was conflicted. We see this outlined clearly in verses 22 through 24. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose I cannot tell. For I'm hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. I mean, thank God that even Paul, the author of two-thirds of the New Testament, the super apostle of the early Christian church, even Paul was conflicted. Remember the song, should I stay or should I go now? That's what he's feeling. Should I stay or should I go now? And if you take him at his word, it almost sounds like he wants to die. We've already said he's in prison. Next time you find yourself in a situation that is so bad that you want to die, hear my voice in your head. You're not alone. You're not the only one. It's going to be okay. Jesus can help you. Okay, even Paul, arguably the most famous Christian other than Jesus in history, was conflicted. So conflicted that on the one hand, he wants to die so he can go be with Jesus. But on the other hand, he knows that he needs to stay to help his people. I'm thankful for Paul's conflictedness here because it reminds me of me. You know, I mean, somebody shout in this house. Paul's conflictedness reminds me of me. I am conflicted. Sometimes I do the right thing, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I want the right thing, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I'm full of faith and hope, sometimes I'm just on the verge of despair. I'm living that knife's edge these days very keenly. And so I felt not alone here. I felt like, all right, I'm not the only crazy person in this joint. Paul was conflicted too, bless the Lord. If you feel conflicted too, one, you're not alone, so don't feel bad, Hmm, that's liberating. Let's just soak in that moment of liberation for a second. Woosa. Okay, you're not alone. Okay, don't feel bad. But also, um, get used to it. Because <laughs> I don't see this going away anytime soon. So you're like, but Pastor Todd, how am I supposed to live conflicted without it uh, making me depressed? 
Well, as we close, we find the answer in verses 25 through 26. And being confident of this, okay, he's confident that if he stays, it'll be more beneficial for his people. I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Hallelujah. Okay, being confident that my life is better spent in the service of others, there it is, that selflessness theme again. You should pay attention. If this is preaching to you, that's God preaching to you, not me. Being confident that my life is better spent in the service of others, I know that I shall continue with you all. Why? For your progress. Okay, here's a, here's a touche preacher moment. All right, you ready for this? Woo! Receive it. Whose progress are you living for? If I'm honest, 90, maybe it's not 90, 90% of the time, I am living for my progress and the progress of my family, almost exclusively. So touche, preacher. Think about your friends. How many of them are living exclusively for their own progress? I think if we're honest, we'd say most of the people we know, including us, are living mostly for the sake of their own progress. There is a roadmap here to changing the world. If all of us introduced even 5% more selflessness into our ethics, the ripple effect would be massive, massive. They just sit down and think about that. If you spent 5% of your money in the service of others, as opposed to how you spend it right now. If you spent 5% of your time in the service of others, as opposed to how you spend it right now. And I'm not looking to make you convicted unless you need to feel convicted. And that's the Holy Spirit doing it, not me. And I am convicted. I need to spend more of my time pouring my life out for the sake of others. Why? Because I'm trying to be like Jesus. I'm a Christian. I'm trying to learn to be a little Christ. Are you living for self or others? And look, if you're living for self and determined to live more and more that way, uh, you might as well, final point, point number eight, live with joy as the goal. I mean, everybody smile in their house. Everybody put a big smile on their face. You actually feel better ah, when you smile. If you're gonna live this way, if you're gonna invite radical selflessness into your way of being, you might as well live with joy as the goal. For your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundance. I just wanna say, there was a lot of joy in the first Christians, and the first Christians were a marginalized, oppressed group of people. And yet they had so much joy in their relationship with Jesus that they persevered through the difficulty of it all. Touche, preacher! That's me, I need that word. I need to cling to all the joy I can find in order to develop the strength I need to persevere on our journey through this valley of the shadow of death. That's me, I'm talking to me. Am I talking to you? Joy. The early church was marked by it. Don't miss out on yours. Have you gotten so busy? Have you gotten so obsessed with money? Have you gotten so obsessed with your reputation and the approval of others that you have lost your joy? Joy is a horrible thing to lose. And a joyful life would be a horrible thing to forsake. And to live joylessly would be a horrible way to live. Instead, today, with all the strength I can muster as I preach the light from the darkness, let me invite you to live certain of supernatural deliverance, full of expectation and hope, boldly. Shame be damned with Jesus as the center of your life, no matter what, focused on fruitiness. What kind of fruitiness? Redemption and renewal kind of fruitiness. And live that way even when you're conflicted living with others, living for others, pouring your life out for the benefit of the people around you with joy. Do that and you will find yourself well on the way to becoming the ultimate in loving self-sacrifice, also known as a Christian or a little Jesus. And somebody said, hallelujah. Hallelujah.